This is St Margaret's Road in the Scotswood area of Newcastle upon Tyne. Not much stands here now, but in the 1960s there stood a row of derelict houses ready to be demolished. It was part of the council's efforts to improve what they deemed to be the slums of the city. Apparently it was going to rejuvenate the area. It was against this backdrop of abandoned buildings, economic depression and compulsory purchase orders that Scotswood saw one of its worst tragedies when, in 1968, the bodies of two children were found, one in May and the other in July. Both children had been murdered. It was a terrible event for the people of Scotswood to deal with, but what really sent shockwaves through the community was when they discovered who the killer was an 11 year old girl named Mary Bell. Born in May 1957, Mary Bell's early life was a difficult one. Her mother was a prostitute specialising in sadomasochism and bondage. As a result, Mary's home on White House Road was frequented by a string of strange men, many of whom Mary would later claim abused her physically and sexually. She also claims that her mother was abusive and neglectful. Clearly not wanting a child, she attempted to get rid of Mary on a number of occasions, passing her on to relatives and friends. By the age of two, it was clear that Mary Bell had trouble interacting with others. She was distant and cold, sometimes lashing out violently at the other children. By the age of four, she started nursery school and she soon gained a reputation for being a troublemaker. She refused to make friends with the other children, instead tormenting them, pinching them and pulling their hair. She got into a lot of fights and on a number of occasions her teachers had to stop her from strangling her classmates. This desire to strangle other kids appears to have developed into a strange obsession for Mary. One teacher recalls Mary asking, why can't I kill him, after being told off for putting her hands around another child's throat. It seems the only real friend that Mary made was a girl called Norma Bell. They both had the same surname but they weren't related, although people described them as being like sisters because they were attached at the hip. Norma Bell was two years older and a fellow troublemaker. The two of them dreamed of becoming notorious criminals and running away together. Despite being older, Norma was definitely the more submissive of the two. Later court records would describe Norma Bell as a simple backward girl of subnormal intelligence. She was easily led by Mary's more domineering personality. Together they would stalk the streets of the Scotswood area, starting fights with other kids, shoplifting and damaging property. On the 11th of May 1968 their behaviour escalated. A three-year-old boy was found wandering the streets alone. He was dazed and had a deep cut on the side of his head. At first it was thought to be an accident, but it was later discovered that Mary and Norma had led the child to the top of a disused air raid shelter and pushed him off the roof. Luckily the seven-foot drop didn't kill him, but the fact that they left him for dead probably reveals what their intentions were. The following day, a distraught mother reported Mary and Norma to the police for attacking her seven-year-old daughter, Pauline. According to the report, Norma had held down Pauline whilst Mary tried to force sand into her mouth and throttled her. Luckily, Pauline managed to escape and run home to her mother. It was 13 days later, one day before Mary's 11th birthday, that the first killing occurred. It's thought that on this occasion Mary was acting alone. She lured a four-year-old boy called Martin Brown to number 85 St Margaret's Road. This was an abandoned house earmarked for demolition. The building was boarded up but she managed to push between some of the boards to gain access. She took Martin up to an empty bedroom on the upper floor and she began to massage his neck. Then she covered his nostrils with one hand and tightened her grip on his throat. 
Later that day, three boys entered the same abandoned house looking for scrap wood. They found Martin lying dead, flat on his back with his arms outstretched. There was blood and saliva running down his cheek. An empty bottle of pills lay on the floor near the corpse. They ran to get help and their builder tried to resuscitate the boy but by that point it was far too late. Around the same time Mary came back to St Margaret's Road with Norma. Presumably she was bringing her friend along to show her the boy she had just killed. They tried to get into the house but they were shooed away by the people inside. It was assumed at first that Martin had found some pills in the room and overdosed. There were no other signs of violence on the body and this strangulation had been too gentle to leave marks. A post-mortem found no evidence of a drug overdose and so, for the time being, his death remained a mystery. The following day Norma and Mary broke into a nursery school on Woodland Crescent by removing slates from the roof and climbing through a hole in the ceiling. They ran rampant through the classroom, kicking over desks, ripping up books and smearing paint on the walls. They also left behind four handwritten notes with messages like We did murder Martin Brown. These notes were strewn randomly around the room. The most disturbing notes, and one that people still ponder the meaning of today, simply read, I murder so that I may come back. These notes had been written the previous night in Mary's bedroom. She'd come up with the idea that they both write the notes together, something she called joined writing. And so with a red biro, the two girls took turns writing the notes, a letter at a time. First Mary would write a single letter, then Norma would write the next letter, and so on, until the notes were finished. It's interesting that they were written in this way, and perhaps it's a good example of Mary's cunning mind. It made the handwriting difficult to trace back to her, and possibly could have been used to implicate Norma if she needed to. The same day as the nursery break-in, Mary also wrote a diary entry in her notebook. It read, On Saturday I was in the house and my mum sent me to ask Norma if she would come up to the top with me. We went up and we came down St Margaret's Road and there were crowds of people beside an old house. I asked what was the matter. There had been a boy who just lay down and died. Below it she drew a picture of Martin dead with a bottle of tablets next to him. Mary was careful to label the tablets in the drawing. Again, this shows some level of cunning. Not only does the writing make her sound ignorant of the death until after the body was discovered, but it also suggests that she may have placed the tablets there deliberately in order to make the death look like an accident. It appears that Mary learned this trick from her mother. When Mary was a toddler, she had to have her stomach pumped after swallowing a bottle of her mother's tablets. Another time a family member witnessed her mother feeding Mary sleeping pills as if they were candy. It's thought that Betty Bell was deliberately trying to poison her daughter, either to get rid of her or because she enjoyed the attention she got when Mary was sick. Another interesting thing about this drawing is that it was later used in court as evidence against Mary. She claimed not to have seen Martin's body, but the position of the corpse in the drawing and the pill bottle were so accurate that they could only have been drawn by someone who had seen him there. Sadly, this piece of evidence wasn't spotted until Mary had killed again. Both Mary and Norma's behaviour in the following days was sinister to say the least. They visited Martin's auntie and started asking her all these questions. Things like, do you miss Martin? Do you cry for him? But they had this eerie smile on their face when he asked. They were laughing like it was a game. Their questions were so insistent and their manner so strange that they were sent away and told not to come back. A few days later they visited June Brown, Martin's mother. When she answered the door, Mary asked if she could see Martin. No pet, Martin's dead, replied June. 
Oh, I know he's dead, said Mary. I just wanted to see him in the coffin. The local people, still thinking that Martin's death was an accident, staged a protest about the dangerous derelict houses in the area. This is a picture of that protest. The sign says, Rat Alley tenants want action, not promises. The girl holding the sign on the right is Mary Bell. Two months later, on the 31st of July, Mary killed again. A three-year-old boy named Brian Howe was playing outside his house with Mary and Norma and his dog Lassie. The two girls led him away, saying that there was a woman coming on the number 82 bus who gave out sweets. When he failed to return home that evening, his parents became worried and his family began to search for him. Two people who seemed particularly eager to help were Mary and Norma, walking with Brian's sister Pat through the streets looking for him. At one point they passed close to a patch of waste ground where large concrete blocks were piled up. It was known locally as the Tin Lizzie. Mary pointed to the Tin Lizzie and said that Brian might be playing among the concrete blocks. Apparently Mary was eager for Brian's sister to find his dead body so that she could see the shock on her face. Norma then said, no, Brian never plays on the Tin Lizzie and led them away. It was only later that night that the body was found, when the police mounted a proper search. Brian Howe was found lying dead, between two concrete blocks on the Tin Lizzie, hastily covered over with weeds. This time it was clear that he'd been strangled, as there was bruising on his throat. Further investigation found other injuries. His hair had been cut away in clumps, and there were six small stab wounds on his thighs. Also, the letter M had been carved into his belly and some of the skin on his scrotum had been sliced away. Inspector James Dobson described the nature of these injuries. He said, There was a terrible playfulness about it, a terrible gentleness if you like, and somehow the playfulness of it made it more rather than less terrifying. This playfulness to the injuries suggested that they had been done by a child and so police began questioning the local kids. Two children in particular stood out as evasive and strange. They seemed to find the murder amusing. On the day of Brian Howe's funeral, Inspector Dobson watched as the coffin was brought out of the house. He also watched the other kids on the street to see how they reacted. He says, Mary Bell was standing in front of the Howe's house when the coffin was brought out. I was, of course, watching her, and it was when I saw her there that I knew I did not dare risk another day. She stood there laughing, laughing and rubbing her hands. I thought, my God, I've got to bring it in. She'll do another one. Now, the details of what exactly happened to Brian Howe are somewhat difficult to figure out because... When they were brought in for questioning, both Mary and Norma gave conflicting accounts to the police. At first Norma claimed that she hadn't seen Brian be killed, but Mary had met her that same day and told her that she'd killed Brian, saying, I squeezed his neck and pushed up his lungs, that's how you kill them. They then both went to look at the body and Mary ran her fingers along his lips and said that she'd enjoyed killing him. Later on, Norma gave a different story. Now, she said, she had been there when Brian was killed. In this version of events, her statement reads, We went along to the blocks. Then Mary says to Brian, lift up your neck. She put her two hands on his neck. She said there was two lumps that you had to squeeze right up. She said she meant to harm him. She got him down on the grass and she seemed to go all funny. You could tell that there was something the matter with her. She kept on struggling with him and he was struggling and trying to get her hands away. She left go of him and I could hear him gasping. She squeezed his neck again and I said, Mary, leave the baby alone, but she wouldn't. She said to me, my hands are getting thick, take over. And then I ran away. The statement that Mary gave was different again, and I'll read some excerpts from it now. She said, We went over to the blocks, and Norma says, 
Ah, you'll have to lie down. And he lay down beside the blocks where he was found. Norma says, put your neck up. And he did. Then she got hold of his neck and said, put it down. She started to feel up and down his neck. She squeezed it hard. And I could tell it was hard because her fingertips were going white. Brian was struggling and I was pulling her shoulders and she went mad. I was pulling her chin up but she screamed at me. By this time she had banged Brian's head on some wood or corner of wood and Brian was lying senseless. His face was all white and bluey and his eyes were open. His lips were purplish and had all slaver on it. It turned into something like fluff. Norma covered him up and I said, Norma I've got nothing to do with this. I should tell on you but I'll not. We went home and I took little lassie home and all. Norma was acting kind of funny and making twitchy faces and spreading her fingers out. She said, this is the first, but it'll not be the last. I was frightened then. Norma went into the house and she got a pair of scissors and she put them down her pants. She had a Gillette razor blade. We went back to the blocks and Norma cut his hair. She tried to cut his leg and his ear with the blade. So as you can see, both girls tried to blame the other and to minimise their own role in the killing. What actually happened that day will never fully be known to anyone other than Mary and Norma. It seems most likely that Mary did the killing, simply given the fact that she'd murdered another child in exactly the same way previously, but it's possible that Norma had more involvement than she admitted to. The letter M carved into Brian's belly is an interesting detail. The post-mortem examination suggested that at first a letter N had been carved using a razor blade, but later on an extra line had been added to it, possibly by a different person, changing it to an M. It reminds me of the combined writing that Mary and Norma did when they wrote their notes. It could be that Mary tried to implicate Norma by carving an N, then Norma changed it to an M so Mary would get the blame. In court they seemed to go much easier on Norma. She seemed confused, upset, scared, whereas Mary was cold and aloof. As I said earlier in the video, Norma was made out to be a naive and mentally deficient girl who was easily coerced by the cunning and evil Mary. For this reason, Norma was eventually found not guilty and she served no jail time for her involvement in the killing. Instead, she just got three years probation for breaking into the nursery school. Mary was evaluated by psychiatrists and found to be suffering from a psychopathic personality demonstrated by a lack of feeling to other humans and a liability to act on impulse and without forethought. This meant that because she had a mental condition that affected her judgement, she couldn't be charged with murder because of diminished responsibility. She was instead charged with manslaughter and served 12 years behind bars. It's difficult to find much information about what happened to Norma Bell after these events. I don't imagine it was easy for her to return to White House Road and be treated with suspicion and contempt by all those around you. To be constantly reminded of the terrible events that she'd taken part in. The most I can find out is that she died of cancer in 1989. She would have been 21, but I'm not sure what kind of life she had. Mary Bell's life behind bars was a troubled one. At the age of 12, she was sent to Red Bank Secure Unit. She was the only girl there among 23 prisoners, and she claims to have been sexually abused by staff and the inmates. She started to self-harm and use drugs, and she became a rebellious troublemaker. She was eventually transferred from this reform school to a proper prison at the age of 16. She was released in 1980 at the age of 23. She was given anonymity and changed the name, so not much is known about her life after her release. We do know that she gave birth to a girl in 1984, and in 1998 journalists tracked down Mary and her daughter, forcing them to flee to a safe house under police supervision. That same year, 1998, Mary collaborated with an author called Gitta Sereny. It was a book titled Cries Unheard, which details Mary's life before and after the murders. 
Interestingly, in this book, Mary freely admits to killing Martin Brown alone, but when talking about the murder of Brian Howe, she becomes evasive and changes her story multiple times. I'm not sure whether this is because she genuinely finds it difficult to recall, or maybe she's just trying to hide the truth. The author of the book points out that whilst Mary could claim that the first murder was just a game that got out of hand and she didn't realise the consequences of her actions, by the time of the second killing she would have known exactly what she was doing and so it's harder to justify. That's one of the problems with Mary Bell's story. She herself is such an unreliable witness, often being described as a compulsive liar. Plus the tabloid headlines were so sensationalised that it's hard to know whether Mary is this irredeemable psychopathic monster or not. One side seems determined to paint her as a violent manipulator with no remorse for what she did. The other side says that an 11 year old girl, herself a victim of abuse and suffering from mental issues, can't be held responsible for her actions in the same way an adult would. They say that she's done her time and is now a reformed woman a loving mother and grandmother who has the right to her privacy. The truth probably lies somewhere in between the frothing condemnation and the fawning apologia, so take away whatever you want from this story. Whichever way you look at it, it's a sad and disturbing case, one that left its scar on the local community. Interestingly, my wife grew up not far from the area where this happened, and she tells me that Growing up in the 80s and 90s, Mary Bell's name was spoken in hushed tones among the schoolyard. There were phrases like, watch out, Mary Bell will get you, said jokingly to scare each other. And so the memory of Mary Bell's crime still haunts this local area. Her name will live on in the minds of scared children and wary parents long after she's dead. Perhaps this is what she meant by the phrase, I murder so that I may come back. Thank you for watching the video, I hope it was interesting. Let me know what you think down in the comments. And a big thank you to everyone who is supporting the channel on Patreon and PayPal. You're helping keep the channel going, so thank you very much. This video did take a bit longer than I thought because I had to seek out a couple of books to research it. Hopefully it was worth it. I find this story very interesting and I wanted to do a good job of it. Anyway, Here's some more videos you might find interesting. Give them a click if you want some more content like this. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video. Until next time, goodbye.